Well, for the last few Sundays, uh, we've repeatedly heard of the connection of the bread with the life. Not just any bread, but the bread with the life. With Christ Jesus repeatedly saying, I am the bread of life. I am life. And in the gospel reading this morning, while teaching at the synagogue in Capernaum, we hear that God has given his son to have life in himself and to give life to his people. Just as the living father sent me, and I live because of the father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not such as the fathers ate and died. The one who eats this bread will live forever. Well, that's a pretty big pill for a Jewish person to swallow, seeing as you're not allowed to eat or drink blood. That's forbidden in the law of Moses. So they say, this is a, this is a difficult teaching, you know, who, who can accept it? How can we do it? That's contrary to the laws of Moses. Of course, we know what this is going to mean and what some of the disciples came to understand that Christ Jesus is talking about the Holy Eucharist, about giving his own body and his own blood on the cross. And when the disciples remember the Last Supper, and then they recall Christ Jesus taking the bread, and he says those words, this is my body broken for you. Taking the cup saying, this is my blood shed for you. And they came to understand that it didn't mean it's kind of like my body, it's kind of like my bread. It's, it's just bread and wine that's a kind of a symbol of something. We know that because the people turned away. They understood this literally, his literal body and blood. And so does the church, but with a caveat. And we'll look at that shortly. The disciples came to understand that what Jesus is talking about here is a great and holy mystery. That they come to understand that they, meaning the church, participate in Christ's death and his resurrection and even his ascension into glory by drinking the bread and the wine that is offered to God as the church's sacrifice in the new priesthood, in the new covenant, under the great high priest who is Christ Jesus himself. Remember, we're called the priesthood of all believers. Bread and wine become the offering. And then the bread and wine of the Holy Eucharist are identified with and in that great mystery of mysteries become the very body and blood of Christ Jesus himself. The early Christians met a lot of resistance because many writers said these people are cannibals. They eat flesh and blood. Well, the reality is we have the Eucharistic bread and wine, and in a great mystery that we don't understand and don't even try to understand, Christ Jesus is present, really present, in the bread and the wine. And when we take the Holy Eucharist, the Holy Communion, we say the body of Christ, and that is the body of Christ. Don't say how. Don't even 100% know why, but we know what we have been given. Because Jesus himself says, 
if you aren't eating and drinking these, then you do not have life in yourself. So somehow, the bread and the wine becomes for the faithful church, the real presence of Christ in the bread and wine. Someone once said, well, you gotta explain that. I don't get it, it doesn't make sense to me. Well, we have to be very careful taking things literally here, but literally that is what happens. So when the Eucharistic prayer is said, we're gathered together, we ask the Holy Spirit upon the gifts of the bread and the wine, body of Christ, what is that? What's the body of Christ? Oh, it looks like a round piece of bread flattened out by a press. Yeah, okay. Well, Christ Jesus said, unless you eat my body, well, there it is. That's Christ's body. Well, some young people think, uh, okay, I understand that, that Jesus is in the bread, but that round thing doesn't look like bread. So they're okay with the Eucharistic theology, but they have a problem with, is that really bread? So we all, we all have our hang-ups, as it were. But we remember that Jesus is speaking to the Jews, and this is very important. Some people interpret what's going on here as if somebody has never had Holy Communion, they can't be saved, because there's no life in them. Uh, I don't read that in the scriptures. But Christ is speaking to the Jews who are supposed to know who he is. This applies to everybody that knows who Christ Jesus is. And if they think they can carve out a life without him, who is the life, and if they're just going to think about Moses and keeping the laws and keeping the commands, and brag about the manna in the wilderness, but not realize or believe that Christ Jesus is the living bread that comes from heaven, they have actually rejected the Messiah. And that's true for people that come to church for 70, 80, 100 years. And they don't really believe any of this stuff, they just kind of go through the motions. Well, that's actually rejecting the Messiah. And as Christ Jesus is teaching these things, they can't handle it. They, they, just, they just can't believe it. It doesn't fit within my human brain. And then he says, the Father has to bless you. You have to open your eyes. You have to want to see. You have to want to understand. You have the ears, but you have to want to hear. It requires something of us. Nonetheless, many of his disciples drew back and they no longer went with him because they're scandalized. And the bread, and the living bread, and the bread of heaven, I came down from heaven. The bread that I give for the life of the world is my very own flesh, and unless you eat the flesh and drink the blood, you have no life in you. They wanted no part of these scandalous words. And again, this is a hard saying for the Jewish people. Drinking flesh and blood is blasphemous to them. But they are required to know that he is who he says he is. He is their Messiah. He is the Messiah. And the church believes that he is the Messiah. And so his words do fit with the church and are accepted by the church. Yes, we may not be able to completely handle it. Yes, we may not completely understand, but you have ears, you have eyes, and you want to see and you want to hear, and God will bless you if you keep that way of your soul to be always seeking, to be always knocking. And then we have that very grand question, 
do you also wish to go away? And Simon Peter answers, Lord, to whom shall we go? I remember son Ray being in med school and it was so difficult for him with his circumstances at home, with his wife with transplants of the dual transplants of her, her lungs. Uh, she was so, so sick uh, before that. And I said, did you give up on your faith? And he said, I, I, where would I go? Where would I go? There is, there is no one else that can bring life and truth. And he said, even if she dies? And he said, yes, even if she dies. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words to eternal life, and we have believed, and we have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. What truthful words are spoken here of faith-seeking understanding? We have believed in you, we followed you, and now we've come to know that you're the Holy One of God, but we don't understand what's going on yet. We're mixed up. It isn't quite clear yet. St. Peter would go on to deny Christ three times. Yet he's reintegrated into the Twelve by Jesus' three questions. Peter, do you love me? Those questions from the risen Christ resonate within every disciple of Christ. Do you wish to go away? Their answer is, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have believed, and now we have come to know, meaning we are coming to know that you are the Holy One of God. And what that means for each one of us is on our own unique journey with Christ. Will you go away to? Where are we going to go? The church must answer that question each and every day. We do that personally and we do that corporately as church. Christ Jesus had to answer that question many times in his sinless life, did he not? When he started his public ministry, he was baptized and driven into the wilderness by rods and clubs. No, the Holy Spirit leads him into the wilderness to be tempted by the evil one. He was tempted not to be the Messiah, not to be what God had sent him to be. He's led into the wilderness, tempted by the evil one, fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he's hungry, and then the tempter comes and says to them, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. There's the temptation, change these stones into loaves of bread. Jesus did give bread in the wilderness. We do know that. He commanded his disciples to give food to the hungry, food that he provided from nothing. He fed the people that are hungry. And now he's hungry and the evil one says, okay, if you're the son of God, provide yourself with some bread and change these stones. And Jesus comes back with, it is written, you shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That means he refuses. He is the bread of life that comes from heaven. And he has to give the bread that if you eat it, you will never die eternally. Yes, he does give earthly bread because he doesn't want people to go hungry. But when the evil one says, prove that you're the son of God by just giving people earthly bread, the line is drawn in the sand and Christ Jesus says, no. Why? Because human beings do not live by earthly bread alone. 
They live by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And he is that very bread. He is the living word that comes forth from the mouth of God. So I guess we could say, and some people have said this before, I think I probably have myself. Wouldn't it be fine and dandy if Christ would have just come to take care of all our earthly needs? Wouldn't that have been much better? He did. He did. He arrived on this earth to reveal that he is capable of doing that, absolutely capable of doing that, but he also came to show and model for us that we, as well as he, will have struggles in this age. Only in this age there will be hungering, there will be thirsting, there will be sorrow, there will be sickness and disease, temptations and tribulations. Yes, there will be in this age, but he has said, I am with you. I am within you, even to the end of the age. Now this will all come to an end, but Christ Jesus knows that we need more than just earthly bread. We need more than just earthly bread for the struggles in this age. We need strength to be perseverant in our faith. And Jesus is the one who does this. He does this by being crucified and having his own body broken and his own blood shed to be the bread of life for the life of the world, to give himself as food for the faithful church. Well, somebody asked me the question one time, yeah, okay, that's, that's good, uh, all right, the uh, yeah, Holy Eucharist, bread and the wine, body and blood, yeah, it's somehow a mystery that that becomes somehow the body and blood of Christ that we take within, and there's an exchange there that Christ is present in power and renewed within us. But, and here is the question, if he's the bread of life that is eternally superior to earthly bread, why does he teach us to pray, give us today our daily bread in the Lord's Prayer? Aha, gotcha. Well, why does he? He said, don't be anxious about your life, right? Don't worry about what you're aware, what you'll eat. God knows you need all these things. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. So why pray upon pray upon pray all the time, the early church seven times a day with the Lord's Prayer. Give us today our daily bread. It's right there in St. Luke's Gospel and St. Matthew's Gospel. Well, some have swept this over and, and said, well, this means give us enough daily bread, real flour bread, uh, barley bread, whatever it might be. Just give us what we need to keep us alive every day. Well, that's not true because some people starve to death. Hmm. It's a bit of a hole in that argument. And I think the church needs to come to face this, and some have, and more will as time goes on, I believe. The original Greek text uses a unique word found only in St. Matthew and St. Luke's Gospel, and that Greek word is epiousius. Epiousius. I know this fellow knows what epi means. Oh, okay. <laughs> The, uh, the, uh, the above, the, the um, um, super essential, super substantial. Actually, St. Uh, Jerome, when he translated the, the Greek uh, scripture into Latin, he uses the word super substantial bread. Nothing about daily. Epiousius does not mean daily. 
Give us today the super essential bread. Christ Jesus in the Lord's Prayer isn't talking about bread. The bread that's at home in your cupboard or in your fridge. So in the Lord's Prayer, what is actually being said is, give us today the super substantial, the super essential, the super duper bread, the heavenly bread, which means our Father, give us Jesus Christ himself every day because we need him. You know that we need earthly bread. You know that we need earthly drink. And if we're starving and dying of thirst, then some of your people should do what they can to help us. You look after all. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. But how is the faithful church given right now Christ Jesus himself in the Holy Eucharist? You ever notice what prayer it is that we pray before the Holy Eucharist? Right before. Which one is it? Now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father. Um, a dear spiritual mentor of mine, God rest his soul, wrote beautifully of this. He wrote, that's Father Tom Hopko. He wrote, the church prays with boldness, without condemnation, with pure hearts and humble voices, calling God Father, that he would give us the super substantial bread. The super substantial bread that God the Father gives us is his own son, Christ Jesus. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. I am the bread that if you eat, you will never die. Seek this bread with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Seek the bread that I myself am because I, Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, the incarnate Word, I who am the way, the truth, and the life, I also am the bread of life. And the one who eats this bread will never die. Christ Jesus says, yes, you have to have earthly bread that you share with others so that they don't starve and you don't, don't starve. God provides that bread, but don't just labor and focus just for the bread that perishes. Come to get the living bread that when you eat it, you never die. Jesus said, I am the bread, the bread of life. And the only place you can find that is on the altar, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. The prophet Amos proclaims, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread nor a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. They will wander from sea to sea and from north to east, they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, but they shall not find. Many people believe Amos is speaking of today. Christ Jesus is the living bread, the living word, the living lamb of God, whose body and blood sacrifice takes away the sin of the world. No longer bulls and goats, He's the teacher who gives the word because he is the word. He's the high priest who offers the one and only perfect sacrifice, and he is that sacrifice. He gives himself as food for the faithful in that mystery of mysteries, the bread of life and the cup of salvation. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. The question remains, will you go away too?
when things get tough, when things get rough. The faithful church answers, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have believed and we have come to know that you are the Holy One of God that gives himself in the bread and the wine, the bread of life and the cup of salvation. Now, and when he returns, we won't need the Holy Eucharist anymore because he will be in our midst and give us life everlasting. Amen. Amen.